Hello, dear viewer. Sometimes you don't really know what you have until it's gone. Take, for example, the author's voice in fiction. You know, maybe it's not such a bad thing after all. As we get into part two of Wayne Booth's The Rhetoric of Fiction, it's worth remembering that Booth spent the bulk of part one responding to a list of modern rules for quote unquote good fiction. And most of those rules revolved around the idea that authors should stay out of the stories that they're telling. That is, modern critics thought that stories were damaged by any signs that the author was creating, manipulating, or commenting on the stories as they wrote them. So they endorsed rules designed to eliminate that kind of explicit involvement of the author in the story. But Booth recognized that those rules were pretty flawed for a number of reasons, primarily because he saw fiction as a form of rhetoric. So not only was it going to be impossible to eliminate the author's influence on the story, but Booth pointed out that trying to obey those rules was likely to result in confusing or unpleasant experiences for the reader. After challenging the modern rules in part one then, Booth spends part two talking about the value and possible uses of the author's voice in fiction. For Booth, evidence of the author's involvement in the story was not taboo, but was instead a valid possibility for writers that provided some unique rhetorical benefits. As he writes at the start of part two, it is not surprising that critics have been tempted to discuss commentary and usually to condemn it as if it were a single thing which can be judged simply according to our general views of the novel. But it should prove worthwhile to abandon such judgments and to look into some good novels to discover the effects commentary has in fact been used to achieve. He then goes on to say, at the very least, we should be in a position to decide with some precision whether any of the particular achievements of the author's voice have been worth the sacrifice of whatever general qualities we hold dear. In other words, Booth says that instead of eliminating the author's voice based on a rule, we should instead take a look at what the author's voice can actually accomplish in a text and then decide what to do with it. So in today's video, we'll take a look at exactly that, the many things that writers can accomplish either through direct commentary as an author or by using a narrator. And in the near future, we'll finish up our discussion on the rhetoric of fiction by looking at part three. So do us both a big favor and subscribe so that you'll know when that happens. And now, dear friend, let's see what authors can really do. Now we've talked about telling and showing a couple of times already, and in some ways you could think of this section of the rhetoric of fiction as a chapter about the benefits of telling. The fact is, there are some things that can be done more efficiently and effectively through telling than through showing, and Booth walks us through several of them. And the first is providing facts, picture, or summary. Author commentary serves really well to tell readers things that they might not be able to find out in any other way. Sometimes it's too hard or complicated to show information, so writers are better off just telling it. Booth illustrates this point by saying, when we remember the many cumbersome mirror views in modern fiction, what he saw in the mirror was a man of middle height, we see how much trouble the desire to dramatize such descriptive detail can cause. That is, some authors get so wrapped up in trying to show rather than tell that they have to invent overly complex ways to get that information to the reader. When you can't just say that your character was of an average height, you have to invent some complicated way of getting him in front of a mirror or something so that the information can come from the character instead of from the author. And obviously that's a step more complicated than it needs to be, and it shows how valuable and effective telling can be. As an added benefit, when authors tell rather than show and convey information through direct commentary, then readers don't have to wonder about whether or not they're being told the truth. A character looking in the mirror might misrepresent their appearance or talk about it unrealistically, but an author isn't going to do that. By allowing room for authors to tell outright then, we can avoid unnecessary chances for confusion or misunderstanding. Secondly, Booth writes that direct commentary is useful for molding readers' beliefs, saying, as a rhetorician, an author finds that some of the beliefs on which a full appreciation of his work depends come ready-made, fully accepted by the postulated reader as he comes to the book, and some must be implanted or reinforced. 
In other words, there are some beliefs and values that are crucial to a proper understanding of your story, so you don't want to give your readers room to misinterpret them. For example, you might be telling a story about a couple that is driven by extreme circumstances to make significant sacrifices to save their relationship. And depending on the reader's views of love and relationships, that story might be about how powerful true love is, or it could be a story about toxic codependency. In most cases, your story can't be about both of those things, so you'll have to do something to guide your reader's beliefs about love for at least as long as they're reading your story. From there, Booth talks about the ways that telling or direct author commentary can help writers to relate particulars to those established norms. If you've done the work to mold your readers' beliefs in appropriate ways, then you'll want to make sure that readers then understand your character's actions in the contexts of those beliefs. As Booth states, we do not agree about whether a particular action is wise, temperate, just, or courageous. And it's a point that reminds us of something that we've already seen in the book. We can't just assume that our readers will interpret events or actions in the ways that we expect them to all the time. It is possible to guide readers through the ways that we show, but showing can create opportunities for ambiguity. It's a simple truth that facts can't speak for themselves, so when it really counts, telling can be the most effective way to get the job done. And that's why Booth writes the kind and amount of rhetoric required will depend on the precise relation between the detail of action or character to be judged and the nature of the whole in which it occurs. Most of the great storytellers of all periods have found it useful to employ direct judgment, whether in the form of descriptive adjectives or extended commentary. So simply put, telling isn't the taboo that the rules might have you believe it is. In fact, as Booth goes on to argue, while much of what we've already discussed can be accomplished through showing, some things can effectively be done only through telling. Often, those are efforts by the author to influence a reader's perceptions not only of specific moments, events, or characters, but of the work itself as a whole. So Booth points out that direct commentary can serve to generalize the significance of the whole work. That might show up in a declaration of the final moral of the story, but it can also show up in other ways where the author steps in to make it clear that you know what the whole point of the story was. It might not be a final moral takeaway. It could just be an announcement that what follows is the tale of a fateful trip. Either way though, there may be some crucial takeaway that you just can't afford to have your readers miss, and that is the time for telling. Or a writer may need to manipulate the mood of the story from the start to make absolutely sure that the reader goes into that dark and stormy night expecting something frightful rather than something relaxing. In such cases, direct commentary or some form of telling is the fastest way to make sure that readers start out on the right page. And finally, direct telling may serve to comment directly on the work itself. Now, I don't really think that Booth is saying that authors should spend a lot of time talking about how great their novel is as they write it, but he does point out that many authors have done just that, and to really good effect. And now, with all of these, the reader's tolerance for such telling may depend on the fashions of the day, but if you ever find yourself having to tell your reader how good your novel is, well, I guess there's really not much to do but just tell them. Now, as you may remember from our video on part one, there's a difference between the flesh and blood author who writes the story and the author that we imagine as we're reading the story. When you read a novel or story or anything, you're using the way that that text is written to form an image of the author. This virtual version of the author then is what Booth calls the implied author. And everything that we've talked about up to this point has focused on the ways that the implied author can comment directly on the work as they write it. But sometimes the author doesn't comment directly on the work. Instead, the author may do it through a proxy by creating a narrator or a kind of character who does the talking in the place of the author. And these narrators can come in two primary flavors as we mentioned briefly in the last video. The first kind of narrator is the reliable narrator, which Booth calls a dramatized spokesman for the implied author. Reliable narrators, in other words, will only tell you the truth as far as the story is concerned. Their version of events is trustworthy, and it accurately reflects the story as the author intends to tell it. Then we have unreliable narrators who, like their name suggests, can't be trusted as perfect spokespeople for the implied author. They may have their own motives and purposes that are sometimes at odds with the story, and that leads them to fib or to fudge the author's version of events. So while narrators by definition tell stories, Booth points out that the narrator's way of telling is also a form of showing. 
So what the narrator does or doesn't tell us shows us who that narrator is. Unlike the implied author, narrators can function like characters, and their character becomes an important part of our experience of the story. Booth even mentions at one point that narrators make the telling personal, as they become sort of like our traveling companions throughout the length of the story. On the one hand, we have the story that is being told explicitly, and on the other, we have the story of our relationship with the narrator, and that story unfolds entirely through how we experience the narrator's manner of telling us what's happening. So by the end of part two, Booth once again challenges the old telling versus showing dogma by explaining not only that telling is sometimes very useful, but also that telling itself can become a form of showing. So perhaps we should end where we began, with Booth's argument that we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss the value of direct commentary just because we feel obligated to show rather than tell. Of course, he's not saying that we should just switch into full telling mode either. What he is saying is that it's worth understanding what telling can accomplish so that we can take advantage of its benefits when we need to. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been in writing workshops where I or someone else was trying to be subtle, artistic, or clever by avoiding all forms of telling. But the workshop feedback in those cases was never anything like, oh my, you're so brilliant and artistic. Instead, after a long, confused discussion about what the writing was supposed to mean, and then the author's eventual confession of what it actually meant, the readers always just said, oh, well, I didn't get that from that at all. So people will always tell you that you shouldn't be doing all the work for your readers. And of course that's true, but you do have to do some of the work for them. If you just dump a bunch of information on them in the name of being artsy and subtle, and then refuse to give them any interpretive guides, well then they're going to end up being confused, not amazed. And that's why Booth says that understanding the value of telling can be so important. When you really think of your fiction as rhetorical or as a situation where you're trying to get your readers on board with the story that you're trying to tell, then telling is your best tool for making sure that there is no room for misunderstanding when it really counts. And like just about everything rhetorical, the real goal here is to familiarize yourself with the tools that are available to you. Then when the opportunity presents itself, you'll know how and when to use them well. Now, as we draw our conversation to a close, let me thank you for spending this time with me. I know I had a nice time, and I'm looking forward to wrapping up our discussion on the rhetoric of fiction in a future video. In the meantime, though, give the like button a respectful high five, tell us in the comments about the great stories you're writing, and take good care of yourselves until we meet again.